आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Hello and welcome to Living on the Edge. This week we break format to bring you an in-depth analysis on the state of India's environment. What was it that sparked off the environment movement in our country and how successful has it been? How critical to our survival are environmental issues? Are conservationists mere prophets of doom or are their fears rooted in reality? And finally and most importantly, can the needs of development and environmental protection ever be reconciled? Living on the Edge correspondents attempt to answer some of the questions you always had but did not know where to find the answers. Early 1970s, Garhwal, Uttar Pradesh. Embrace the trees, save them from being felled. The property of our hills, save them from being looted. Armed with this simple slogan, the women of Garhwal were able to save thousands of precious trees from being felled by contractors. This was the beginning of the Chipko Andolan, a non-violent mass movement against the destruction of the forests. But this was not the first time ordinary people took the law into their own hands. In the 1890s, organized resistance to tree felling by the British was reported in the same areas. About 250 years ago, in Jodhpur, 360 Bishnois sacrificed their lives to prevent the cutting of trees by their king. Researchers say there are scores of other such examples from all corners of the country, showing that environmental protection was seen as intrinsic to human survival, even in the days long past. Take the case of tribals in the Chota Nagpur and Santhal Pargna areas. They are fighting to protect their forest, not for the just 10 or 20 years, but for the past 400, 500 years. And these are the people who fought against the British rule. Although the environmentalists in India have not given that, environmental movement labeled to this movement. But in my opinion, I think that was the one very strong environmental movement in the country. And that movement is still alive. It's not just the forest that the present day environmental movement is concerned with. Over time, it has broadened its focus to many other areas. Resistance to big dams, protests against toxic waste dumping by the West, lawsuits against those polluting the environment, and the protection of species. Environmentalists have been successful in raising consciousness and implementing successful strategies in several areas. As a result, the government has been forced to recognize the need to protect ecosystems. The forest policy, for instance, in principle, has set aside forests for conservation and recognizes the need to involve local people in the effort. Encouraging case studies have emerged in some areas. Over 40% of a designated 33,000 hectares in the Aravallis in Haryana are green again. But just five years ago, the area was barren. Overgrazing and overexploitation of the hillsides had taken their toll. The secret of the success of the Aravalli experiment 
was joint management between the forest department and local people. Last year we started the nursery. The Aravli officials gave us land and irrigation facilities. We made beds and planted seedlings. When we initially sowed, the, sowed an area the, and the first flush of grass came, the people immediately started taking it off. They even started uprooting it because it, they thought it was first come, first served. Then we started training, telling them that it takes time. The rooting should be allowed, the grass should seed. The people from outside came and taught us how to plant. Now we do it ourselves. Unfortunately, such projects are the exception rather than the rule. Successful initiatives are rare. Instead, environmental horror stories, accounts of ever-increasing pollution, human misery, and disappearance of species are what people have come to expect. In fact, many argue that environmental degradation is the inevitable price for progress. As far as the energy demand is concerned, any technique you devise, there is no escape from facing some aspect of environment. That is because any sort of a development is nothing but a series of compromise with environment. No society in the world has developed to any extent without making some degree of compromise with environment. If this is true, the threat to natural systems can only increase as liberalization gains momentum. Already, many state governments are denotifying protected sanctuaries to allow industry to move in. Industry and environment has always shared a very complex relationship. Industry has always been held accountable that any industrial activity is bound to deteriorate environment. On the other hand, doing too much about environment has been considered, at least in the past, as something detrimental to the growth of industry. But can industry ignore the social and environmental costs of its operations? Are the needs of industry and those of common people mutually exclusive? And will the enforcement of accountability really dampen industrial growth? Name Anjamma, village Sultanpur, health ailments 12 miscarriages. Name Naikoti Yadya, village Sultanpur, health ailment tumor in stomach. Name Bandhu Swami, village Sultanpur. Health ailment, severe skin allergy. Name, Mutayya. Village, Sultanpur. Health ailments, paraplegia. These four case studies have one thing in common. They are all residents of Asia's biggest chemical producing township, Patancheru in Andhra Pradesh. In the 1980s, 5,000 cattle died here after consuming contaminated water. Hundreds of families have had to leave because their lands have been rendered infertile. The lakes, the river and the wells in the town have all been contaminated. The Patancheru case study is depressing, but it is also an indicator of what needs to be done. Effluent treatment and recycling have to become the order of the day. In Tamil Nadu's tannery belt, Units are thinking of pooling funds to set up treatment plants to reduce the impact of pollution, showing how consciousness is spreading. Today there are two ways by which we can convince industry in doing that. One is pollution control is a way of making more profit. Pollution is not just uh, anything uh, coming out of the heaven. It's something you're releasing in the, your water bodies. In 99 cases out of 100, if you can take that back, don't release it on the drainage, don't release the sewage, don't release it up in the sky. If you can collect it back somewhere and then you can very profitably utilize it. A day is coming when people will exactly look down a company, down upon a company, which is not conscious of the community, conscious of the society, conscious of the environment. 
For the urban dweller, air pollution and slums are probably one of the most obvious symptoms of environmental degradation. But there are lakhs, even millions in our country, men and women for whom the environment is crucial. The woman who has to walk several kilometers to get water because wells have dried up, or the parent who's forced to sell his child to survive. People like this do not understand cause and effect theories of armchair conservationists. But even they know that they must respect the land, air and water that sustains their very lives. It was to address these issues that the representatives of 130 nations met in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, in June 1992. The conference was supposed to evolve an international consensus on environmental problems. Instead, it only heightened ideological differences between the industrialized North and the developing South. While the North blames the poverty-stricken third-world countries for environmental degradation, developing countries feel it's the unsustainable industrial expansion of the North that has caused all the problems. That the bulk of the contribution to the ocean problem comes from the West, industrialized to West. And the technology even to ramify that still lies in the West. So even if you want to reduce a very negligible portion of ozone depletion, you still have to go back to them for technology. That means that business economics is not going to suffer, whereas we will end up paying more for lesser energy level, which already in a very low scale. By participating in some international treaties like the Montreal Protocol and treaties like that, India is actually giving up its own rights to govern its own environment. And uh, the first world countries are actually telling us what are global environmental problems, not what we think are global environmental problems. That our problems will be their problems and their problems will be ours is a fact we can't escape in the long term simply because it isn't possible to insulate any country from global environmental changes. The Earth is a closed system, but few countries seem to realize that. And nowhere is this more evident than in the dumping of toxic waste on unsuspecting third world countries. This whole thing of giving waste to developing countries on humanitarian grounds is a big lie. You say that we are giving you metal waste because you need it, but actually, for instance, if they say, here is zinc waste for you, you will find that the entire waste will have something like 40 or 50 percent of zinc. The other 40 or 50 percent will be full of extremely hazardous things like lead, cadmium. There are often cancer-causing substances which harm not just the health and safety of workers, but also the environment. Primitive recycling techniques, cheap labor, and the absence of accountability make the handling of toxic waste a dangerous process. Multinational cold drink companies understand this very well. Yet, although India has enough plastic of its own to recycle, these companies simply send their plastic waste here. Everyone knows the problems with plastic, but that doesn't seem to bother these companies. Their hypocrisy is patent. Would they dare export similar waste to a country in the West, where environmental consciousness is razor sharp? Perhaps that's why developed countries find it cheaper to dump their muck on us. India has a large secondary metal market and where industries have been set up to import the scrap from those countries. So this is really for recycling as distinct from dumping. Dumping uh, has a connotation of that it's sent here as garbage and kept here as garbage. But that is not so in our country. Why should he stop anybody? Because he's not working on that waste. He's not inhaling dioxin gas. He's not going to have cancer, hopefully. And he does not live in the kind of places where, I don't know if he's been there and seen the kind of recycling facilities that operate in India. There's no perfection in this. Uh, the implementation, I'm not saying is, is uh, perfect. There are uh, some holes in it. Uh, we have laws in place, we have rules in place. And the greatest instrument is awareness and concern. All kinds of hooligans will get into this act. All kinds of corrupt industrialists will get into this act. And you will find that we, in the name of saving the economy, we will import all these things, but ultimately we will destroy the environment and our people. At the end of the day, global warming, ozone depletion, species conservation and toxic poisoning seem like jargon that most people feel unable to control or do anything about. But the reality is, Individual actions, however insignificant, always add up. That's why you and I hold the key to successful conservation initiatives, just as we have the power and capacity to make things worse. The question is, how? 
That's what hundreds of you ask us in your letters. The answer is by realizing that everything is interconnected. The extinction of species, population growth, and consumption patterns. Let's take the extinction of an animal species for instance. Many experts argue that it's part of a natural process of evolution. If that were true, the destruction would have been gradual, not as rapid as it has been over the past few decades. New species would also have evolved and there would have been an equilibrium of sorts. Extinction of species in the recent past is a direct result of man's intervention. Man in his continuous search for more in terms of natural resources and the wealth that comes from natural resources disrupted a wilderness system to cause species extinction. There is no question of natural evolution taking place on planet Earth. Now let's see what the consequences are through the eyes of a single species. If we tamper with the habitat of a tiger, he loses his prey whether they are deer, stags or wild buffalo. The prey he feeds on are dependent on grasslands and forests. These in turn are home to scores of plant and animal species. All exist in an ecological pyramid, critically dependent on each other. If one part breaks down, the entire system begins to deteriorate as the equilibrium is lost. This applies to everything, from big dam projects to individual consumer patterns to deforestation to mining. Sandstone mining in Rajasthan, for instance, may boost employment and help industry, but it destroys agricultural land, lowers the water table, loosens the soil, and increases dust related diseases. Bisalpur Dam will provide water for drinking and irrigation, but will cause displacement of 63 villages. Sandstone mining in Rajasthan will provide availability of stone and generate employment, but will cause lowering of water table and dust related diseases. Damodar power plant will provide energy but causes pollution of Damodar river and air pollution in surrounding areas. A balance sheet such as this is vital, but difficult to compile if you don't know all the facts. Perhaps that's why many people are ambivalent about the environment. Whether it's environmental activists or the double income no kids generation or the industrialist who has a motive behind perpetuating a consumerist culture, everybody seems to have a point of view on whether the environment needs to be protected at all. Convincing people that it needs to be protected isn't easy. Try to tell a middle-class teenager that a relationship with a beggar is similar to the relationship between a richer and poorer country and see what she says. That's India's problem, I guess, throughout, like, uh, we have inequality of whatever, income, and some people just don't have it and some people have it. Why should we bother, right? Why should we bother? If we have the money, we have the things to buy, and it's help to buy it, then go buy it, right? I don't think they are, uh, it is increasing the rich and poor divide. Because I feel that there is enough purchasing power even for that section. But then you have to create more uh, resources for the rural areas. That is not difficult, I feel, with a country like ours and with the kind of resources we have. But resources are limited. City dwellers may not realize this, but 59% of our population, that is about 500 million people, still have trouble meeting their food and shelter needs. What meaning can Western lifestyles have for them? Consumerism and the blind aping of the West seems to be the order of the day for the middle and upper classes. But for a vast majority of our people, there aren't enough resources to go around. Even in the United States, 20 million people are permanently hungry and 3 million are homeless. And yet, the average American child receives 260 US dollars as pocket money per year. This is more than what 30 million people around the world have as their per capita income. If you think that's absurd, consider this. The developed world forms only 23% of the world population but earns 80% of the world's income and consumes 60% of all energy produced. In human terms, one American child eats as much as 33 Indian children or 422 Ethiopians. 
and American consumes 2 tons of steel every 5 years in the form of cars, eats 112 kilograms of meat each year. An average Indian on the other hand consumes 50 kgs of steel annually and eats only 2 kilograms of meat each year. In fact, conservationists say that in terms of consumption patterns, the population of the United States would be about 25 billion and India's just 300 million. No matter what Westerners say, conspicuous and wasteful consumption in their countries is much more a significant cause of global environmental problems than unbridled population growth in the third world. But does that mean that we can afford to ignore the fact that we are adding one Australia to our population every year? And that unrestrained growth, coupled with rising consumerism, is only going to increase pressure on rapidly depleting resources and destroy the fruits of progress. Natural resources, uh, depletion Natural very resources will be depleted very or rapidly. Or and because of this, there will be unrest in society. The environment will be disturbed. And this will ultimately lead to violence. In the 50s, if you showed me how much you used our natural resources, I'd know how developed you were. In the 90s, how you conserve your resources will tell me how civilized you really are. Arguments like this have little meaning for those aspiring to the Western dream. New goods, services and a better lifestyle are what people want. But 85% of our population can never have them simply because there just isn't enough for everyone if Western consumption patterns are the yardstick. Technology is not the answer to everything. The ultimate solution it will depend on the society. You know, we, the, ultimately it depends on what the cost society is going to pay. If you have a lot of pollution control environmental systems or if you do not have it, we must have the will, political will, administrative will, bureaucratic will and societal will. We must have the will to make both governments and environmentalists realize that conservation and development are only the two sides of the same coin and that both are endeavors to see the earth as a sustaining home for all time to come and for all life to come.